I'll try to tell you what things are interesting to me and what things my group has been involved with. I will not differentiate too much you know, what exactly we did in each place because this is more of an overview and much of it was done by a very broad community, but I'll try to give you a sense of why I find it interesting. And there will be data somewhere there, so don't worry. Um, okay, so we all heard about, oh, it helps to turn this thing on. We all heard about the Human Genome Project, um, and you know this is a nice slide from the, uh, the NIH, you know, visualizing how we get from a cell to a sequence. But the real thing about the Human Genome Project is that we ask ourselves why this doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> okay, I guess I'll get stuck here. Um, is okay. So we have this. 10 to the 9th, depending on where you come from, you, you spell it differently how you call it, but this huge number of letters, it's a small book, what do we do with it? Um, and as you know, it's a blueprint for life, it makes cells work, and so the basic idea is that somewhere in the DNA there is information, and much of the reading of that information is through the process that we call the central dogma that you all hopefully learned in high school somewhere or heard about it, that DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein, proteins do work. More or less, this is all you need to know about molecular biology. Uh, and clearly, we don't have the same protein makeup in each of our cells of the body. The differences between the cells is which gene are being expressed when. And so there's a lot of regulation, and this is the subject that interests me the last 10 years or so. Um, and I saved you the slide how, as a proper machine learning, I, I strayed into becoming what I am now. I don't know how to define it. Um, but the question that interests us, initially as data analysis and more recently as experimentalists, is how these things are regulated. So the process of transcription is one point of regulation, but and we'll focus on it, but I just remind you that there are many other points of regulation. Okay, so what do we know about transcription? Again, the, the model is a cell that we senses its environment. The environment can be external or internal, and you know, it suddenly doesn't have sugars, or suddenly it ha it's exposed to heat. It has to turn on some genes, turn off some genes, and we want to understand how it decides who to turn on, to what extent, how fast, and so on, and we know from experimental data that the, the there is a very intricate control program. Almost every single gene has its own individually tuned control program, so how, do, how is this specified? So the answer goes back a long way. Uh, uh, th this is a theory put forward by Jacob and Monod, and uh, Jacob died uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, so one of the biggest pioneers in, in genetics, and that said that in the DNA, there's not only the gene, but also the parts of information that tell us how to regulate the gene. So somewhere here in what we will call a regulatory region or a promoter, there is a small piece of DNA that en encodes uh, instruction, and the instruction is being read by a protein that binds to that piece of DNA and when it's there, it recruits all kinds of people, uh, sorry, proteins, and they produce RNA. So by binding there, it can um, promote or inhibit transcription. That's very nice how these things happen. So if you look at the protein level, the protein binds to DNA. It likes DNA in general, but it searches along it until it finds a place that it really likes and then stays there for a while. And this is done by Essentially, now you have to go to chemistry, and we'll skip that part of the lesson, but basically by affinity of virus forces. Um, the problem is that the sequences these proteins recognize are very, very short. So six to eight, ten letters. So if we do the math, um, you know, it has to search a huge space, ten to the ninth letter, and it has specificity of six letters, um, or eight letters in this example, eight letters by chance you find them quite a lot. So in an E. coli, this is not a problem because the number of random appearances is rather small, but in the human, it becomes huge. And if we look at uh, a real transcription factor and actually searching because the sequence is not random, 
we found a million sites for a specific inflammation regulator. NF-kappa B is a super important protein, won't go into that, but clearly it doesn't bind to all those places. So how do we deal with it? So the cell will deal with a specificity problem by issues like combinatorial control, which effectively increases the recognized length, but that doesn't so solve the search problem, and the, as computer scientists, you know that the best way to solve the search problem is to search in less space. So the biology version of that is that many, actually most of the DNA sequence in our body is packed away, put aside, and those proteins do not search there. So you decrease the space, you solve the problem. So let's talk a bit about this packing. Um, basically, there's a hierarchy. The picture of chromosome that we all saw, or hopefully saw, is essentially highly condensed DNA and proteins that are condensed together. Out of it, if you look at intermediate structure, there are all kinds of things, but at the end, we have this small structure of those beads on a string, where each bead is called a nucleosome, and it's a complex of proteins that around it we wrap about 150 base pairs of sequence. And those can be further packed, as you saw, into larger and larger hierarchies. But let's talk about this most atomic level of binding. Already here we see that there is 150 base pairs around this. They're less accessible than this region. And this has immediate implications when we talk about regulation. Because if before I show you this picture, now if we put a nucleosome here, and there are many mechanisms by which this can happen, this site is hidden, the transcription factor, the red protein cannot find it, and the gene is not turned on. So by occlusion, we can regulate different genes. A more interesting thing happens is when we think about pro those nucleosomes as more interesting modifiers. So here are two genes, and only this one has the exposed site. The, this one has a very weak site that when there is low, of, low amount of the red molecules, they don't bind there. So the early gene has a strong binding site and it attracts a transcription factor. And so when we start having red molecules, this thing turns on very fast. This, the graph is like time. But when we have more and more red molecules, some of them bind here. Now, if you go to classical uh, you know, kinetics, then a weak binding site means that it's also, it binds at, you know, we have lower probability of binding and higher probability of disassociation. That would mean that on average we would expect the late binder to show very slow kinetic but also very weak kinetics. But if you want something to go up very fast, very high but late, this won't do. And the solution that is found many times in the literature is that we the first guy recruits the purple guy, which is called a chromatin remodeler, which removes the nucleosomes and then exposes a very strong site that now that it's exposed, we can actually have very strong transcription. So using nucleosomes combined with additional machinery, we can implement things like a threshold-related phenomena and things like that. So in this case, very strong response, but only after the level of the red things reaches the thresholds. Um, and stays there for a while. So just by adding this factor of ability to hide and un to occlude or remove occlusion on the DNA, we can start playing the regulatory game. OK, so we could have talked now for the rest of the talk how nucleosomes are positioned, but instead we'll talk about something, additional layer of complication. So it turns out that those nucleosomes not only occlude the DNA, but they can also annotate the DNA. Um, picturally, think of it as we can put flags of different colors, or more formally, we can be put beats. For the chemist-oriented, essentially, there are all those color dots are residues on the proteins that make up the nucleosomes that can be covalently modified. Covalently modified means change in a stable way. Okay, and those changes. Essentially, this is an all very old picture. We know of more modification existing there. So there are between, depending who you ask, between 30 to 40 or maybe more bits of information that we can tweak on this bead. Okay, so now the bead doesn't come in uniform color. It comes in 2 to the 40 
potential callers. That's quite a lot. We can, you know, what do you do with this information? Um, so the, the, even more, before we say that this is information, we need the ability to read and write, and we know about enzymes that put those modifications in a specific way. We know about enzymes that can remove them. We know about proteins that know how to bind only to a particular combination of modification, usually one position or two. So we have readers. And so we have all the machinery in the cell, we know about machinery in the cell that can use this quote-unquote substrate. Um, so what does it do? That's one of the biggest questions in the field. There's a hypothesis that this thing encodes interesting information. It's called the histone code hypothesis. And one of the biggest areas in the, in the field is identifying those players. But I want to move forward and ask what, how can we study what they're encoding. So the, the big question is what, you know, OK, so we have to do 40 bits, more or less. You know, we can argue about it. Does it really encode something? If so, what? Is somebody maintaining that information? Is it, you know, permanent? Is it short-lived? You know, definitely an important question. Somewhat. It's easy, we can measure information and say it's there, but you know, who's using it for what? What is the biological function? And of course, all of this is tied to mechanisms. You know, how do those things work? So for those who are worried, I'm not going to answer any of those questions properly, but I'll try to give you some taste of the answers we know about. Okay, so we'll take a break and talk for a second about the technology we're using right now to study those things because, you know, we can hypothesize, but we really need to understand where the data come from. So the chromatin at a very abstract level is this beads on a string, DNA wrapped around those nucleosomes, and we can extract it from, you know, we grow cells in the tube and extract the chromatin. Um, it turns out there's an enzyme that digests, prefer, likes to digest only exposed DNA. So if we take this material and expose it to this enzyme, it will digest all the linkers between the nucleosomes, but we leave the protein DNA complex intact. Okay, so now we essentially separated those beads into individual beads. And now we can, you know, apply various chemical procedures that denature the protein, remove them, digest them essentially, and we are left with a large amount of short DNA fragments that essentially are the ones that were protected by a nucleosome in the living cell when we harvested it. And so now we're, we're faced with the question, how do we read that? So in the old day, you could test for you know, a small sequence here, it, it, it appears or not, or to some quantity. But today, using technology of sequencing, we essentially take this sample and we sequence. What does it mean sequence? We put it in a machine that returns the first N letters. N used to be 30, now it's 50. If I want, these days, if I want to pay enough, I can get the first 100, which is more or less the, almost all of the sequence, um, of a good selection of those sequences. So here's the one thing you might want to remember from this talk. This is a slide taken from the NIH. And it shows the cost of sequencing. How, how much would it cost to sequence a single human genome? Um, the Human Genome published around 2000. The estimate back then that if they would have redone the project, it would be 100, only $100 million. They, they invested more than that, I think, in the actual project. And we see a, a you know, steady decline in the cost, which surprisingly up to Five years ago, more or less matched perfectly uh, Moore's law, which is the white line. You know, 18 months reduction by half. And then something happened, and we see this huge drop in price, which, by the way, is compensate. The cost is always the same. You just get more output. So that means that the output grew uh, in, a, in a much faster, I don't know if we call it super exponential, but definitely much faster than Moore's law. 
Um, this race has been predicted to go here to the thousand dollar genome, and actually people publish that they have the technology for that. And here we'll have the hundred genome, hundred dollar genome. The last year we see some flattening, mainly because of commercial reasons. One of the competitions went out of business. The other company doesn't have any incentive to improve on itself until the next competition will come along. So, the, but in a sense, we expect this, and we already know of the competitions that will show up that will drive this even further. This means, and this is regardless of what I told you before, this means that anyone who's working on big data that relates to genomes, biology, medicine, and so on, the problem there is getting the disk space to store the output. Not even talking about analysis. This rise meant that with the same machine, you invest the same amount of money, but you don't buy disks fast enough. Because disks, like computers, follow Moore's law. Um, so this is interesting. So things that were science fiction here today are everybody does them without even thinking about it. And students don't know how we did research without sequencing 100 million reads. So returning to our story, we take the sequence tag, and the numbers are really in the millions, 50 million tags. So by now, that means we covered out of our tube a huge amount of sequences. We sampled the, the population really well, and we can re now take those tags, map them to the genome, because we know the genome sequence, and then know that if this tag goes here, then there was something here, because we saw only the beginning of 150 base pair fragment, and we can reconstruct where the nucleosomes are. This is a small genome, the yeast genome, one chromosome in the yeast genome, and this is the coverage, how many reads cover each base pair. It looks like random noise. Uh, zooming in tenfold, this bar, by the way, is now 100, uh, uh, 100K uh, um, base pairs. Zooming in forward, we, uh, inward, we see patterns, and if we zoom in another tenfold, we see very nice coverage that represents individual nucleosome positions, areas that are not protected, and areas where this population does not agree on the nucleosome position, so we get a smeared signal. So we can reconstruct exactly where there is a conserved position, where there is some dynamics in the population, where there is something that pushes away nucleosomes in those cells at this time. But this is only positioning. What about modification? Well, we'll add a twist. If we now consider some modification shown in red star, we can now use antibodies. We do the fractionation and so on, but we use antibodies to pull out only those nucleosomes with this modification, and then con continue the same way we did before, and we can get only those sequences that correspond to places where a nucleosome with that modification protected them. Modulus, some noise, and so on. And so we can do today studies that go and build things. This is a small fraction of a genome, and each color is a different modification. And you can see the individual nucleosome peaks, and you can see on top of the gene, and we get these complicated pictures, tons of data. Um, what do we do with it? This supposedly, each one of those, we would just measure here about a dozen or slightly less, represent one of those bits of information we can store on the nucleosome. So how do we take that and make it into something that we can work with? Well, using all the technology, back in 2005, we were one of the first groups to be involved in analysis of such data. We tried every trick known to me at the time. And we ended up saying there is no signal here. Basically, there are two patterns. One is modification that go with whether, whether you're in a gene or not in a gene, or whether you're in the start of the gene or an end of the gene. So essentially, it tells us where we are. And then the second is functional. Is this gene active or not active? So only two axes, location and activity level. Just to show you the location, let's zoom in on two modifications. The, let's call them the green, which we'll return to later, and, and the purple, you see some pattern. And this pattern doesn't necessarily make sense, but you see that they are slightly, they are disjoint, more or less. But if I show you the map of the genome on top of that, and now you see the genes, 
it's very easy to see the pattern. Here is a gene going to the right. On, its, on the left, we have a green peak and then a purple peak. A gene going the other direction, the green peak is at the beginning. Essentially, green peaks mark the beginning of genes, purple peaks mark the body of genes. And this is not, pick any region of the genome, this will work. No, no exceptions. So essentially, from those two marks only, I can find genes. In fact, there was a nice, very nice paper three years ago, four years by now, that just using a simple classifier trend on those signals found in the human genome a thousand genes, more than a thousand genes, that were not known before, that do not encode proteins, and by now there are textbook material about a whole class of genes that are doing really important stuff in our body that were not, except for one or two anecdotal examples, nobody knew about those non-coding long RNAs before this trick. So just for measuring those chromatin marks, we can find where the genes are. That's really cool. We can think about it that for the cell, it's really important to know where the genes are, so it might be a useful information. Okay? So is this really being used, or is this really being maintained? So let's go back to our big question quest series. Um, there is information and state, and I didn't go about active versus poised versus inactive and silence, but there is essentially this kind of information and some other interesting regions in the genome marked in a special way. But is this working memory or storage? Okay? Because it changes the way we think about it if it's one or the other. Um, so people use this term a lot called epigenetics. Epi, epi means beyond genetics, any information that is inherited that is not in your genome. And it's the hottest word in, in medicine to find the epigenome of cancer and this disease and that disease. Um, and people are talking about what information is passed to one twin and not the other, although they have the same genetic material and so on. But a real question is, are these modifications part of the epigenetic hype? Um, and I'll go back one step. I'll remind you the genetic information is stored in DNA. DNA is a very stable molecule in the cell. It does suffer damage and so on, but the cell is very good at fixing it, mainly because there is redundancy here. And the redundancy helps replicate it in an essentially perfect way, up to some small, uh, you know, small caveats, but basically, except for run, you know, mutations, most of the cells in our body carry exactly the same DNA. So DNA is a very good information storing and passing on material. What about the nucleosomes and their modifications? So suppose we have these nucleosome templates and, you know, just two modifications. What happened in replication? Are these stored? When we take a collection of cells in the tube, they all seem to have the same state. So it's somehow restored, but is it passed along or being rebuilt? Moreover, it, you know, unlike the DNA that we don't talk about the fact that DNA does not change during the life of a cell before division, in our case, it's totally unclear that it, sh it should stay. So we started working on the first problem and then uh, did something about the second problem. Uh, but I want to raise the issue that we think about it's good to maintain information, but there is a classical control dilemma between a stable system, like this Boeing plane that, you know, you have to spend a lot of energy to turn it, uh, versus this fighter plane that, you know, F-16 was the first fighter plane that was built in a way that is instable. People cannot fly it without a computer because it jumps around all the time. Why is this good? Because you can maneuver it very easily. It doesn't want to stay where, where it's going anyhow, so you can push it towards the direction you want to go. So if you have a stable system, you maintain information for a long while, but it's hard to change. If you have a very transient or instable system, you can react. You can change decision. And cells do show very rapid changes in transcriptional programs. So maybe it shouldn't even be maintained. So we have to, you know, it's not trivial that we want to maintain this information. So to look at this, we asked the question about turnover during the growth phase. Turnover is basically the situation where one nucleosome is disassociated from the template and another one goes back in. 
Now, if they're all the same for, our, for our, the way we measure them, we cannot notice this happen. And so the trick is a called a pulse chase. We introduce new nucleosomes that are marked with a different antibody tag. It doesn't matter. For all our per the description is suddenly, at some point, we turn on the production of blue nucleosomes, and then we can measure whether you know, a yellow was replaced by a blue. OK? That's the, the non-technical description. And then we can do all kinds of math by measuring time course after turning on the blue, how fast the blue invades different regions. At each position, how fast we get replacement of yellow by blue. And jumping forward quite a bit, we show that nucleosomal exchange, uh, but at least one or two order of magnitude differences in the rate of exchange between different positions. So some position, the half-life of a nucleosome before it's being replaced by another one is in minutes, and in others, it's in hours. So we went and searched where they are, and again, I'm jumping a lot of steps, but, but in fact, we found that most of the places where nucleosomes are changed are at the beginning of genes, suggesting that at the beginning of genes, even genes that are not active, by the way. Somebody is constantly replacing the nucleosomes. So the beginning of genes is where the decision to transcribe or not transcribe is, and suddenly we see that, that there the information is, seems to be the, less, the least stable. So this suggests either a mechanistic story uh, that there is regulation on that and competition with transcription factor, or that there is some pressure to change those in order to allow ourselves. These are not... Uh, um, contradictory to each other. One is essentially saying that we are in an instable system, the other tries to explain why it happens. Okay, so this is, so we see that there is turnover even without replication, but when we go to replication, things become even more complicated. Ignore the animation. Uh, because when we replicate, we have to double the DNA. We also have to double the amount of nucleosomes. And we know there's a huge amount of production of new proteins that, are, that serve to be nucleosomal um, during the replication. So all those gray ones are new ones. And the way I drew it, there was a partition of the original ones. You know, each one of the daughter strand got you know, a random share. But clearly, we lost a lot of information in this step. But if we go after a while, we find this information restored. So are these guys telling their neighbors that, you know, I used to, my neighbor used to be red, so please, you know, let's change you to red? Or is something completely different is doing that with, regardless of what we copied? It's even non-trivial that something that was in this position, that this red guy was in this position originally. It could have been, you know, disassociated during the replication and then recruited to be associated in a nearby place during the replication. So we really don't have good assumptions. The only thing we kind of knew was that the division in bulk was kind of symmetric between the two daughter cells. So the daughter cells will receive half the nucleosomes or the histone, the protein makeup of their parent cell, of the mother cell. So here I won't go into the method. The idea is again using pulse chase, but looking across generation, it involved more things and just... So we had a paper that showed that nucleosomes do reassociate more or less within one or two positions from where they were before. Uh, this is not a direct observation. It has to be indirect data analysis and modeling because it's extremely hard to, to see this happen in a direct way. Other people's data in ours suggest that nucleosome, new nucleosomes are usually in yeast are the same. In humans, there is a difference between different stages of the replication. Um, do old nucleosomes tell their, the new neighbors what to be like? That's a hard question, and the, the answer is sometimes. Um, so repressive marks are very good at spreading around. So if you have a repressive mark, you tell your friend to be repressed as well. Most other marks are not maintained. Actually, they're actively erased. So again, this memory is not a real memory. It's a mark that is constantly being, you have to maintain it actively in order to, to leave it there. So if you want to have this mark of active gene, you have to constantly put it there. So this raises again the question of, OK, if this is not memory in many cases, in some cases it is, but most of the cases we look at, it's not 
a real memory, then who cares? What does it do? Um, so think of it as RAM versus a hard disk. We do use the, you know, the memory of the computer, but where? Um, and the approach many of people take, and we also took, was trying to look at doing genetics. So genetics is a very cool trick, um, just to give the, you know, one leg, you know, the, again, the one slide uh, talk. You have a wild type cell, and it manages to turn on some gene of interest, and we're happy. And now we go to this cell, and we mess around with gene X. For example, we remove it or we introduce a mutation. And we do the experiment again, and our gene of interest still turns on normally. We learned that X is not crucial or necessary for the turning on of our target gene. So we learned something not that, that interesting. But if you mess up with Y, suddenly we see some effect. Did we learn something? We learned one bit of information. Y is somehow involved in the process, not much more. But this allows us at least to map the relevant components that can are doing something for this process. And from those, we can start working. So we thought, why not do genetic dissection on all those chromatin marks, basically mutating the place where you can put the mark so you cannot turn on the, the beat or you cannot turn it off, and then seeing what happened. Um, and we ran into a problem, which is that Chromatin and transcription are constantly changing each other. So like this Escher picture, the chromatin direct transcription to some extent, but transcription also direct changes chromatin as it works. Part of the way to put those marks is to have transcription. So if we mess with the chromatin and we pretend that this affects transcription and measure something, actually we are fooling ourselves because this feedback loop compensates, and so we either do not see an effect because the system compensates using feedback, or worse, we see some kind of totally indirect effect that is not relevant to what we want to do. Um, and essentially, messing around with, with histone-related mutation has two very diverse phenotypes. Either the cell live more or less normally, or they die. So either you, you mess them so badly you cannot measure anything. OK, it's important, but we knew that already. Um, or you see very little effect. And that's because the cells compensate actively. So, th so this is a classical question in, in engineering, how to reverse engineer a system that has a lot of feedback machines. And the answer is, don't take this system in a steady state, but look what it, ha what it does when it changes mode of action. So if you start a car and it has a bad timing, you will see the, you know, the, the car not moving smoothly. But once it got momentum, probably it will be much harder to detect that the timing is off. So we went up about this approach, basically looking what, how the system responds to stimulus where it has to turn on and off a gene. And I wonder how much time I have, because I do want to get to something in the end. 15 minutes. We're cool. Um, so basically, the idea is that now the phenotype is not the gene is on and off, but rather how well do we, t we do a stimulus, this gene is turned on by the stimulus, and now we look at the mutation and see whether it, you know, we didn't manage to turn it on, or maybe just we got a delay in the timing for turning it on. And from that, we get the phenotype. Notice that in this case, if we measure here, we didn't, won't see any difference. If we measure here, we'll see a huge difference. So we went and did this experiment. I'm skipping a lot of details because I'm losing the audience for lunch. Um, but basically, if this is a gene that is turned on respond to stress, now this is real data, not imaginary data. Some mutations make it respond even faster. Others make it very sluggish. And we were very happy to see, and this is not just one cute example, but this is very predominant in our data, that at the beginning there was very little difference because the gene was off both in the mutant and in the wild type. In the end, there was very little difference because the system stabilized, but in the middle there were huge differences. 
So this is was kind of a, we, we, we showed that we really should look at dynamics. An interesting thing that surprised us, and we'll return to that in a second, is that the same mutation for a gene that is repressed had the opposite effect. The repressed gene was, didn't repress so well, while the, express, the, the, the repressed mutation caused the gene to repress more sluggishly, and this mutation that caused that gene to jump up, it caused this gene to really turn off much faster. And so we collected a large matrix of those things. Again, clustering is the most important data analysis tool you need in biology to show something. Um, and when we do clustering, we see that essentially if we have here 200 mutation across 150 genes and the effect of different time points, uh, we see that, and, and so each one of those kind of things is actually several time points for the same mutation. Um, we see that there is a big group of mutations that cause most of the genes that respond to be hyper-responsive. Like the example of those genes that turn on more than they should or turn off, repress more than they should. And there's another bunch of mutations that had exactly the opposite effect. This was surprising to us. We spent a lot of time trying to find whether this is an artifact of the experiment or things like that. In the end, the, most, the best explanation is that these mutations were mostly mutations that damaged the ability to move and change nucleosome positions. And these mutations were mutations that caused nucleosome turnover. So basically, this returns to the story we had before. If you have nucleosomes that stick in the place and you cannot move them, you cannot work with them, it's very hard to turn on and off genes. If you have nucleosomes that are not stable, then you do things, but you, you, you have less memory, and so you change your re regulatory program much faster. So this was nice. And we wanted to talk about more things, and I'm jumping Throughout the story, one to one more lesson, which is a lesson about feedback. So remember the green mut modification that I told you appears at the beginning of every gene? There was something like that 20 minutes ago. 15, I don't know. There's a whole pathway that we know how these things comes about. Uh, essentially, it's brought about by polymerase, the machine that does transcription, when it starts working. That's why it's at the beginning of genes. Okay. But we know also about readers that read this modification and make the nucleosomes at, the, at that area more prone to transcription, more adaptive to transcription, they acetylate them. So if you look at the literature, this is a picture from some review, essentially you interpret it as a positive feedback loop. You turn this thing on, it's a way of a polymerize to make it easier to do transcription the next time around. Sounds really cool. OK, so we have a positive feedback loop. What do you expect when you remove, you damage the feedback loop? Our expectation was that genes that go up will not go up as much, because the feedback loop was maintaining, helping them to stay up. And the genes that were up already, you know, maybe will not initially be as high. When we look at the mutation, and again, I'm not displaying these things, we saw essentially noise. There was no coherent pattern. So genes that go up in wild type, some of them were affected this way, some that way, but in general, there was no story like this is a general feedback loop that is necessary. Now, I remind you, this mark is being put at the beginning of every gene in the genome when it's being used. So, and we put a mutation that ban this mark. So this mark that was everywhere on all the genes, we use this to find genes, now is gone. And the effect? The cells are not happy, I, I will tell you that. It's not like it's totally redundant. But the effect was very inconclusive. In fact, the only place we saw coherent effect, and for that you needed to read the names of the genes, were these things because these were repetition of, of genes that represent very large class of genes, the ribosomal genes. And they, what happened there, they were repressed upon stress and they were not repressed as well. So they were, in some sense, the repression was damaged when this so-called activating mark was not there. 
So again, jumping forward a bit, what we learn from that is that repression in the wild type is red, the mutant is, is blue and the mutant is red. Repression was damaged, different kinetic, different stresses. But the overall story is that most genes that are repressed are being deacetylated. They don't change the other modification. And this group of genes increase their activating mark, which is this red thing in this here, and do not change that acetylation. So they have totally different repression machinery, and that repression machinery is dependent on this active mark. So our conclusion from that was, which in retrospect made a lot of sense. You know, you have highly active gene, you mark it, and then when you have to repress, you know how to find it, right? But, so it's not used to keeping this thing working. It's used for knowing where to send the, the police to stop it when you have to you know, shut down everything because we hit it with a very strong stimulus that tells it you have to shift your gears. So in retrospect, it made a lot of sense, but it was totally opposite what everyone except one person in the literature wrote. So you have surprises, and when you think about feedbacks, you, you have to think about them. Skipping this, I want to throw another small story, and then I'll try to wrap it up and return you to machine learning, if I can. Everything I told you up to now was looking at populations of cells. And I don't know if it will come to surprise. Apparently, to computer scientists, this is a really hard surprise. Cells that are identical in terms of their genetic makeup are not identical in terms of their behavior. So there is a lot of cell-to-cell -cell variability. Sometimes it's good, often it's bad, and it's actually it's not surprising because there is a single event that happened on, the, on one copy of the gene that started transcription, then clearly that event, any variation in making that very simple discrete event will be amplified by the rest of the process, which is an amplification process. So how do we measure this? We, have, we use a trick that genes we can tag genes that they are fluorescent, and then we can view them by microscopy. And in this movie, you see cells that the gene they are turning on is a green fluorescent protein. Um, and you can see how each cell turns on the gene uh, a different rate. And if we do image analysis on this time-lapse movie, we can essentially reconstruct the trajectory of induction in each one of the cells in our image. And now we, s we can see that in this example, this is, these are wild type cells, all of them turn on the gene, but there is a lot of variability in the final amount of product among them. Skipping forward a bit, uh, we can start dissecting these things and blame most of those things, most of the variability on the onset time, when the gene was turned on and the turn off time. And we can even see that mutant, again, I'm jumping on things, we can even show that some mutants essentially change both the on times and the off times of the cells. So essentially some mutants change the dynamics of these things and therefore change the productions, while others essentially maintain the same distribution, so we think they affect not the turning on and off, but rather something else. So this gives us a perspective about the stochastic event that happened on the chromatin, and they have to be stochastic because at the end it's a single molecule that finds a target. I mean, the law of thermodynamics step in at some point. Um, so there has to be some stochasticity at, at the end. And we can start interrogating the variability. So I want to put all this um, in context, but I'll first throw in the data. So to collect those movies, we built a, a laboratory that has uh, automated microscopy, and more importantly, automated liquid handling in order to grow the cells, to make them to microscopy. Our target rate right now is modest. It's only a, up to a 1,000 strains assayed per day. Uh, doing the calculation, that means that for 10 hours, the microscope has to take on average uh, one image per second. Um, it's not a lot of images. If you take security camera movies, you have much more data. But this is data that we really want to analyze a lot of pixels, most of the pixels in some sense, and to quantify them. So this is a huge challenge in terms of making it work, the biology and the automation. But the image processing is also a challenge, and the statistical interpretation is also 
quite a lot, but these things are starting to run. This is actual picture from my lab. I took it with my own hands, my own camera, uh, whatever. Um, so wrapping everything back, we now have data from a lot of mutants and for a lot of genes of those trajectories of single cells. If you go back to reviews, people describe this process of regulation as discrete steps that go between, you know, remove a nucleosome, this guy binds, it recruits that guy. You know, these are very discrete events. They happen with stochastic timing. What we are going forward after we, you know, we spent three years dealing with technical problems, but in the going back to graphical models and still remembering there is something like that, is to try to test whether what we know there explain what we see here in terms of variability, kinetics, and so on. And the way to go there that at least I believe is, is that we're talking about discrete events with continuous time. As it happens, people in our community are not afraid of continuous time, although some people used to be afraid of them. And we have a lot of tools for dealing with very large models of many random variables of continuous time discrete event. And this, I think, will be the, the proper modeling language for trying to understand this phenomena and also modeling what happened when you have knockout and whether your predictions match your experimentation. And so where we really want to be is in this loop between experiments and modeling and going back to experiments. And these models are integration of a lot of insights from biology, but also tons of data that tells us indirectly about the biology because we cannot measure the rate constant of every event we can do, but we can measure the end effect in terms of the observables. So this is the outlook for you know, doing something here. Um, so I talked about genes, chromatin transcription. Hopefully you learned one or two, two things about biology. If not, I apologize. Uh, there is data, sequencing images, and so on. Automation uh, is a huge thing, statistics, but I think the, the hard problems are going to be in the modeling. Um, and I have a very nice group to thank and collaborators that also we are very, it's almost the same group, but in two different continents just meshed together. Uh, so thank you very much.